My name is Raphael Cassier and I am chair of the Audio Engineering Society South German section. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all to this event. If you're interested in joining the AES, joining the section events or being notified about upcoming events, then please see the QR codes on the screen and get in or just get in touch with one of us. So without further ado, I'll invite Elena Shabalina, who is in charge of organizing the research colloquia to say a few words and introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thanks, Rafael, and hello, everybody. It's nice to see you all here. Um, a little bit of the household. Um, we run the research colloquium series for the ASL German section. Everybody is welcome. And this is a very friendly format where we try to combine the theoretical and the practical part together. And after the presentation, we have an unrecorded discussion where we welcome the listeners to ask questions. This is a less formal format as a conference. So if it's not exactly your field, if you have a questions that you that you would not normally dare to ask, please go ahead and ask. This is why we are doing all this. Um, the link to the discussion will be posted in the chat. We'll have to switch meetings so you all can just unmute yourself and switch your camera on later. So please check the chat for that link after the presentation. And our topic of today is object-based audio applications from the concert to your sofa. And our presenters are Banu Shahin, Javier Frutas Bonilla and Stefan Bock. I will tell you a little bit about them at the beginning. Um, Banu graduated from the Audio Design Music Technologies program at the Yildiz Technical University Istanbul in Turkey in 2014. During her bachelor's studies, she attended to the Institute for Computer Music and Electronic Media in the Falkland University of the Arts for a year as an exchange student. In 2014, she was accepted for the Music Acoustics Master's program of the Erich Tienhaus Institute in the Detmold University of Music. There she, there she specialized in room acoustics and investigated the correlation in between room acoustical parameters and seat preference in Detmold Concert Hall in her master thesis. In 2017, after her graduation, she started in a manufacturing pro audio solutions company, DNB Audio Technic, as a member of the education and application support department, where she is still working. She has a passion for immersive audio and has been involved in various DNB sounds game applications during her employment. Javier studied technical telecommunications engineering at Carlos III University in Madrid, Spain, and received his Master's of Science degree in Media Technology in 2013 from TU Ilmenau in Germany. From 2013 to 18, he worked at Fraunhofer IDMT as a system engineer for different spatial audio applications. And since 2018, he is employed at DNB Audio Technic at System Design and Trainer, where he continues helping customers to create immersive experiences. Bregenz Festival, Classic am Odeonsplatz, Zurich Opera House, Malmö Opera, or Ankara Presidential Theater were some novel projects in which Javier was involved. And now Stefan is a multi platinum award-winning producer and mastering engineer. He started his career as audio engineer in 1987. He co-founded the MSM Studios in 1991, where he was chief mastering engineer and general manager. Stefan led MSM Studios to one of the most notable and renowned mastering facilities in Germany, where he mastered countless gold and platinum winning records. In early 1998, Stefan started establishing MSM as a premium audiovisual post-production and DVD authoring facility. Since, since 2007, Stefan and his team have been involved in Blu-ray encoding and authoring services. Under his leadership applications like Pure Audio Blu-ray and M Shuttle have been developed. He was involved in the very early stages of immersive audio and is an expert in formats like Dolby Atmos, DDSX, Auro 3D and Fraunhofer MPEGH. Okay, now I hand over to our presenters. Thanks a lot um, to Elena for the introduction. Um, I hope you can hear me well. 
Um, so the aim of this session is um, to present the object-based audio applications in different directions. For that purpose, um, we will start um, with a brief introduction. And yeah, there it is. And history of sound reinforcement to bring um, us some perspective. And following, we'll present current system design applications. Uh, what should one consider when it comes to a proper system design will be the topic of this uh, section. How to create or implement the object-based audio design for a certain immersive system um, will be our next topic. And then following, how to transfer the immersive metadata gained in a concert environment to your home. These questions will be our reference points to uh, talk about our current workflow, the possibilities we have and the challenges we face. And at the end of the presentation, there will be um, a discussion, as Elena also mentioned, uh, where you could give a feedback about your own experience, uh, as we presume that your background is highly diverse. So uh, we are also looking forward for new ideas as an inspiration to overcome those challenges presented. To draw the complete uh, picture to you, um, we decided to use uh, the painting analogy uh, from the system design, from the empty canvas, through the act of painting, and finally we'll talk about the frame. Yeah, um, before starting, mm -hmm. uh, let us yeah, explain what is this talk not about. So it's not about information about a specific product, but it may happen that we need to name certain products. Um, it's also not about comparing solutions from different manufacturers. It's not about what we have done against other people, but um, some pictures will be used of pictures of our design. And I think most important, it's not about sales. As Banu mentioned, it's an open discussion between all of us. So just to keep everything clear. So Banu, back to you. Thanks, Avi. So um, in his article, Jesse Klapholz starts with uh, the first time someone said, what did you say? The need for sound reinforcement was established. Obviously this uh, goes back to ancient history, but for the sake of timing, I'll skip to our um, own backyard. So don't worry, you can just, I have the full control back. Um, for us, the history started with mono with one single loudspeaker when the first PA system was uh, installed and operated in an exhibition in 1915 in San Francisco. Um, there were reports for people who were dancing to a mysterious music in the air. And I wonder how this colloquium will sound like in 100 years to our future generations. Now imagine there's a four piece band on stage. When they are mixed in mono, all the instruments will be packed into one direction. On the bright side, all of us getting exactly the same information, but not all the information needed. Because mono is simply mixing the whole band in one channel on a single wire. And one wire would mean one dimension, no left and right no ups and downs, only one direction. And whatever you pack onto this wire, they interfere to each other. They simply cancel each other out. And then we got lucky and all of a sudden uh, another dimension was opened, which brings us to the stereo. 
by using the pen pots um, or delaying one loudspeaker over the other, then we were able to shift the phantom source in between two loudspeakers. But um, stereo has been highly depending on where and how you are listening, except uh, the hardly penned instruments like guitar or um, trombone player in the mix here. The sound image is changing depending on where you are listening to a stereo system. So the proper stereo imaging only works only uh, through uh, headphones or um, for those lucky few in the sweet spot. If you see the vocal singing in the middle of the stage, but you hear her voice coming from the left side, just because maybe you were sitting slightly closer to the left PA stack, um, you just lose the whole um, sound image. And that creates a confusion in brain. And this confusion actually has even a term, it's called uh, schizophonia. I hope I can pronounce it correctly, um, as it's dangerously close to um, schizophrenia, which has nothing to do with it. So um, coined by Canadian composer Sheffer, refers to a dislocation between what you hear and what you see. Um, now, to explain why this is important, I would like to share with you a snippet of a series called Big Bang Theory. Uh, I think it's very self-explanatory, so let's just watch. So, uh, that scene was actually the inspiration of my master's thesis later on, and I ended up with um, uh, in a concert hall measuring 33 seat locations and investigating the correlation between preference ratings uh, with standard room acoustical parameters. Many sleepless nights, uh, thanks to Sheldon, I would say. So um, he was searching for the acoustic sweet spot in the movie theater by um, using his voice as the excitation signal and his ears as microphones to find out um, where the room sounds the best. When it comes to finding the sweet spot for a stereo system, our job um, is relatively easier because it lays along the middle of the left and right PA. Can I then? So, while using stereo or mixing for stereo, we always um, assume that the speakers are um, ideally at equal distance to our ears. But in real world, um, the, the reality is a bit different. This is a calculation um, made in East software and the size of a living room around three um, by four meters. Um, big. As you could see in the picture, um, the ideal word only applies to the white zone in the middle. I wonder, can you see my mouse? Okay. <clears throat> the color code here is indicating the um, ITD gap or um, so to say the initial time delay gap up to six milliseconds, which displays the difference in arrival times between the first uh, two direct sound arrivals. The white zone um, shows the area of a proper stereo image perception. So if you are watching a movie close together with your partner in the middle of your couch, then you're safe. But what happens when you fight? Um, and when you fall apart to different corners of the room and all of a sudden the sound image, image changes completely, you lose the stereo imaging. So um, if you have a stereo system at home, uh, it is highly recommended to stop fighting and stay close instead. Same measures in a larger scale. Um, the size of the venue here is something like um, 35, no, 25 to 30 meters, a typical size of a European theater. Um, so although people pay the same amount of money um, for this front row, they don't get the same quality of sound. Right here um, at sites, um, the initial time delay difference is as high as 
40 milliseconds. Um, so object-based audio brings a solution to that problem to uh, fix this conditional experience because it aims to increase um, this sweet spot as big as the audience area. We can now um, provide audience a correct sound images, uh, imaging regardless of the listening position and loudspeaker amount. Here's a picture of a milestone of sound reinforcement and the wall of sound of Grateful Dead. 600 speakers, 26,000 watts, and God knows how many amps. Um, each musician had a PA of their own uh, where all speakers were just um, placed behind them. And despite its success, it was um, very time consuming to set up and um, uninstall the system afterwards, as you could imagine. And also very expensive to transport this 75 tons of equipment. So finally, they needed to replace the wall of sound with a more um, practical system. Object-based audio also works um, like a personal PA system um, for each musician. Today, uh, we can use the power of signal um, processing and psychoacoustical principles to um, achieve a format agnostic and scalable reproduction to different room sizes and number of speakers. You probably have been dealing with terms like 3D, 360, special, surround, binaural, immersive, enveloping. Well, well it's a terminological rabbit hole that I rather not like to go down because uh, we could end up with highly philosophical discussions on what is what, as we had before with Harvey. When it um, comes to object-based audio, it is basically an approach for spatial audio uh, reproduction. It's not necessarily immersive audio. It's not um, always 360 either. It could be a 180 degree system as well. So object-based audio is simply some audio plus some metadata. Apologies for the mistyping. Um, the metadata could be the positioning or directivity of the instrument, color, grouping, language, etc. Could be highly diverse depending on the medium and the application. If we go back to our band here, uh, what we do in a channel based reproduction uh, is to capture each signal, mix in a uh, digital audio workstation, um, could be the software or the hardware, and create a final mix for a specific target loudspeaker layout. An ordinary signal, um, stereo signal can be uh, denoted as 2.0 as shown here, and it could be also um, applied to other um, channel-based audio configurations like 5.1 surround as an example. The downside in this approach is that it's not scalable. It, is, it requires a fixed amount of uh, loudspeakers and once you render out for this fixed amount of loudspeakers then um, you just don't change your loudspeakers setup. For object-based audio reproduction, on the other hand, um, audio signals are added with the metadata, rendered in the audio processor, and mapped to loudspeakers. In this way, uh, the same content can be rendered uh, onto various loudspeaker layouts, unlike channel-based audio. The term rendering here describes um, the process of generating loudspeaker signals from the object-based audio scene. Um, this processing takes into account uh, positions as well as uh, so object positions as well as the loudspeaker positions. 
So when you move the object here, um, it's um, rendered according to the new position and different systems use just different algorithms for this rendering. As a result, during a show, uh, each person in the audience would get a slightly different mix for each instrument, thus uh, they, they all can be localized properly. So, but what should we consider to be able to do a proper system design for object-based audio? I hope Javi has a answer for us for that matter. Yep. Okay, so let's try to, to answer that. Um, well, first of all, let's set the, the scene and let's do a virtual trip. And we start our trip in, in Munich. Um, maybe some of you know this studio, MSM studio. Um, what Banu, I can see. Um, ah, you need to move that window. Thank you. So um, in the studio, there is only one, one chair, one seat. So there wouldn't be any discussion with Seldom inside the studio. Um, I just want to call your attention to the fact that all loudspeakers, they are aiming at that seat. So that's, that's our sweet spot. So in the next slide, um, we are going to travel to Japan, to the cinema in Japan. And instead of one single seat, what we have now is one preferred listening area around two thirds of the length of the room. So our system design is optimized for that area. The loudspeaker, the aiming, the SPL, over the distance, everything is optimized for that area. It means there could be certain seats, those in the corners, that they are not under the coverage of all the loudspeakers. And in the next slide, we take the plane and we come back to London. And well, now it's not about an area. Now it's about multiple areas over different levels. So usually it is difficult, uh, if not impossible in, in this example. Um, it's not possible to cover all the areas with a single loudspeaker position. So here the, the key word is segmentation. So in the next slide, you can see as we, what we need to do is we need to divide the audience into multiple areas, address them individually, and then combine or integrate them to work all of them as a single one. So that's, that's the trick. Um, okay, let's see what factors in the next slide, what factors we need to consider. So everything, um, for us, everything starts with, uh, with the model of a venue. Um, this venue can be measured. Um, it can be maybe exported from a CID program, but we need to model the, the venue. Um, then we need to know the performance specification. So the setup, what have to show, what has the show designer in mind? Um, it's just a stereo setup or do we really, do we need an, an immersive setup with loudspeaker maybe only in front of, in front of us or do we need the, the loudspeakers also all around us? Um, and once we know that what kind of show we want to do, we need to know, of course, if we are doing um, classical music, um, electronic music, hip hop, because the, the content will define our SPL requirements and the target frequency response. So um, those are our requirements, but in our list, um, in the factors we need to consider, we have usually certain constraints. Um, there are architectural specifications and under yeah, the size of the states, the, the height of the state, and usually we have certain visual constraints. So um, for example, if in the same example as before in the cinema, we have, we can put the loudspeaker behind the screen, no one sees them. Um, if you try to do the same in a concert and put five loudspeaker in the middle of the stage, probably the musicians, they wouldn't be really happy with that decision. So 
you need to, to fly them. Room acoustics, it may happen that there are certain surfaces that you need to avoid with your design. Uh, we have also legal constraints, um, typical one, um, weight limitations of your rigging. Um, if you try to install a 360 all around you surround system, so you're going to install loudspeakers all around you. And if you're trying to do that in a typical European opera house, 300 years old, you need to ask for permission to drill a hole in the wall. Um, rigging, usually we cannot rig the loudspeaker where we want, but where we can. And logistics, this is also an, an, an interesting um, topic. Um, in the next slide, um, you will see uh, an example. Um, so I hope more or less you can see, so in, in the center of the, of the picture, if you click one, Banu, uh, doesn't help with the contrast. In any case, I'm not sure if you can see there are, um, in this case, seven arrays. So obviously five, seven arrays is more work than rigging uh, only two arrays, but it's something it's feasible. So um, behind those curtains is the loading dock. And so in that case, the truck is coming in. You need to unload the truck, move your cases and your array cards under the rigging point, and then you rig your array. Um, as I said, five, it's more work than two, but it's feasible. Now the question is, um, if the designer says, now nah, you need loudspeakers all around you. So one click, please. For example, at that position. Uh, now the problem can be to push the cases and all the cars through all the seats in order to build the array at those positions. So sure, I can do an acoustic design, but please, before asking me about the design, double check with your rental company if it is possible to build the arrays at those positions. Okay, those are the factors. Then let's see now the segmentation. So um, I said before that we need to divide the audience into multiple areas. And actually these areas are the consequence of selecting certain loudspeakers to fulfill the sole requirements under the given constraints. So for example, starting with the center cluster um, over the proscenium in this example, it happened, uh, well, there, it happened that I cannot completely cover the last rows. So for those rows, uh, you cannot see my mouse, so the upper red rows, I would need a delay system to address those seats. So in that case, my main area could extend from the upper green area up to down the fifth, the sixth, the fourth row. Why not up to the first row? Well, it's again, it's not comfortable to see the singer in front of you and to hear the voice coming from a loudspeaker on, on top of you. So, to avoid this, what we need to do is we need to install a second line of loudspeaker in the stage slip to first cover those rows. So this would be the yellow area. And secondly, to lower down the spatial image. So the same coverage principle applies for um, the side fields. In this case, those are those purple areas and the delay under balcony. So all the red areas. In this case, um, the coverage of the delay under balcony is not, is not caused by the position of my main loudspeaker, it's caused by the acoustic shadowing of, of the balconies. So now the question is, how does object-based audio apply here? How does it help us? So actually, if you think about this, what we have is we have different loudspeaker setups reproduce, reproducing at the same time the same acoustic as seen in the stage. Or in other words, we have a spatial processor which is rendering and combining all the different setups at the same time. It's not today mixing with X loudspeaker and tomorrow playing back with X plus two. It's different setups being rendered at the same time and being combined. 
So this is another nice application of um, object-based audio. Let's see this in a real example. We take our plane. We were in London. Now we are going to travel to Munich again. Um, so this is the Odeonsplatz. And this is a picture which was taken from the very last row. I don't know if you have ever been in Munich, in this, in, in this area of Munich, uh, but this monument is bigger. Um, it's quite big, let's say like, let's say like that. Um, so Banu, now we can see the colors. Um, you cannot see the loudspeaker, but inside this green circle, uh, it's there. We have our main loudspeakers, six of them. Then um, in yellow and purple, again, our front fields for the first rows up to 10 meters. Um, in purple, the side fields for the seats um, left to the right, closer to the stage. And since this venue or this, yeah, this venue is so long, we are going to need the, the delay loudspeakers and we have three delay lines here. And last but not least, as an example, we have a 360 system. What we call 360 is what usually people call a surround system. So loudspeakers all around you. Blue lines represent the positions and in the next click, in the next animation, you will see a couple of, of those loudspeakers. So this is another view of the, of the stage. Um, again, just to represent the size, Inside the yellow area, there are certain loudspeakers. The front fields, they are so big, um, but you cannot see them in the images so far away. Um, and in the next slide, again, another picture of the dimensions of this venue. You can imagine in the center, you can see a tent, a white tent. This is the FOH, and more, it's usually bigger than a typical living room. And this is our daily job. So this is what we need to, to work with. And yeah, this is what, what we will need to discuss later. So how to translate what we are doing for, in this case, 12,000 listeners, uh, how to translate that into your, into your living room. So one, one important question, Banu used at the beginning this analogy um, with the canvas. Um, Let's imagine uh, that we have uh, an audio object and instead of placing it in the stage, we want to move it to the right. So somewhere around the surround area. In this case, it's possible. So we have loudspeakers. We will use those surround loudspeakers to reproduce the object from this direction, maybe in front of that building. Um, the question is, does it really make sense? Because yeah, certain people, I don't know how many, hundreds of them, those which are sitting on the first row, they will hear um, the direction, they will hear the singer, maybe singing them. However, what happens with the people behind the FOH? There is no coverage, there is no, they cannot hear the object. So, as I understand, my job is not only to create this canvas, but I need to communicate to the customer or to the show designer what they can do and what they should avoid. And if what I recommend to avoid, if it doesn't match in their idea of the show, then they need to communicate again with me and I need to redo the system design. So it's this communication, it's, it's really, really important. And it's something I think Banu, we, we will discuss a little bit further. Yes, sure. So, um, as Javi was mentioning, everything is connected and needs to be communicated. Um, so, the question here is, do you need to take the system design as reference uh, to, your, to design your show or the system designer needs to take your show as reference to his or her work. Sometimes we find ourselves being both a system show and a system as so an audio designer. In that case, it's a bit different, but still. Um, and what does the artist say? What does the director say? And what do they exactly need to perform their show? And 
do you want your show to be played back at people's living room? If so, what do you need to consider before and during the show? Things are a little bit tricky here um, as every element of um, this triangle could influence each other. Looks like um, subatomic particles to me though. Were you watching too much science fiction movie nowadays, Javi? Probably in Blu-ray. So um, obviously communication is crucial for efficiency, but um, where to start? Let's say um, the moment you were involved as the show designer, the system was ready. And if the canvas handed over to you from the system designer um, is as uh, big as the stage plane, then you need to uh, paint your picture on that area. Let's say um, you have an electronic music material and you would like to pre-program a show for object-based audio and you would like maybe to move sound objects all around and to do all other crazy kind of things. Before you start your show design, maybe the first question you should ask is, what is the coverage? Is it a 180 degree system or a 360 degree system. There is no use in automating and moving objects all around the venue if uh, you don't have a playback system designed for this. Even if it's um, a 360 system as Javi, uh, Javi was mentioning um, for his um, Odeon Platz example, sometimes Although there is a 360 system, it's used only for emulated acoustics, but not for the positioning. So, um, of course, as an artist, you have the power to influence the system design, but only if you inform in advance. So, punctual communication is a lifesaver here. Maybe the second question you should ask is um, how many objects you can use? Let's say um, if there are 64 objects available, but you prepared a show with 200 projects, um, objects instead, um, and maybe you routed them all around, then you would need to rethink your uh, whole show design. You would still make it work, but you would need to redo some things. Um, moving objects, is a sensitive topic as well, because in case of overuse, it could um, tire the audience. In my experience, I will say less is more. And on the other hand, um, when dealing with a big venue, one should be careful about using percussive transient sounds while moving around, because um, obviously um, we cannot beat physics and we cannot travel back into the future yet. So, we need to consider the path length differences of individual sound objects to the audience. If it's a live show, on the other hand, we need to know um, about the stage positioning plan as well, communicating to the director, again, communication. Uh, once the positioning plan is there, and um, then we can start with, the, with our show design and maybe to um, creating the sound objects and positioning them in our control software or hardware. Um, one should also clarify if there are any movements on stage. Let's say maybe at some point, one section of this uh, big band starts to move towards the sides of the audience area. And then maybe the vocal walks through the stage at some point. So if so, you should add this to your system, uh, to your show design as well, too many designs accordingly. So uh, maybe using a tracking system or automating certain parameters in the software or hardware you use, or prepare some cues for these scenes and um, pre-program your show. Let's have a look at the object-based audio workflow here for live. And um, we have again our band here. 
we capture their signals through our stage box and then send it over to our mixing console and to our network, amplifiers, loudspeakers, and finally to ears. Uh, this was our general workflow so far um, for channel-based audio. For object-based audio, there is one additional element in our system. It's the audio processor, where the metadata is added to the audio signal and then mapped onto, uh, onto a set of loudspeakers. Of course, a big part of the workflow is the system design and uh, show control. And show control possibilities are enormous. Um, one can use some show control softwares like QLab, Canvas, Chatein, or MaxMSP, and digital audio workstations like Pro Tools, Ableton Live, Studio One, Reaper, Nuendo, just name it, using some plugins in different formats like uh, VST, AAX, AU or hardware controllers like tracking systems, either radio tracking or optical tracking, follow spot systems like ZegTrack, um, Stage Tracker, BlackTracks, Timex. By this, you can control the lights at the same time. So maybe following the sound objects um, just when they are moving around or you can mute inputs uh, when the sound object leaves the stage um, by just um, entering necessary commands and pre-programming it so, or you can um, change the room setting when the actor is at a certain position on stage. Um, Another possibility is control through a console like Digico, um, Lavo, or Avid, um, through MIDI, OSC, or maybe through their own protocol. Just be sure they can talk to each other, then you're safe. Or using other hardwares like Stream Deck or through these magical gloves as Imogen Heap does in her shows. Um, so the possibilities are endless. Another element you could add to your object-based audio system is the emulated acoustics. Um, remember the example of the Odeon plat that Javi uh, was just showing. It's very common in Europe to make open-air classical concerts. And what would be the typical playback system of a symphony orchestra? Yes, it's a concert hall. Without a concert hall, uh, it would sound artificial and flat due to environmental conditions. And one tool uh, to overcome this issue is the emulated acoustics. You could basically position the orchestra on stage and pour a bit of um, concert hall acoustics into your mix. It's also a very useful tool for the orchestra itself, because um, room acoustics has a great influence on the musician's performance. There are many studies available on that topic. So using emulated acoustics, creating an acoustic shell like here in the Ravenna Music Festival in Italy, um, would make a great difference on the music being performed on stage. So now um, in my hard disk, there is the live multi-track recordings with some metadata like positioning, space, etc. cetera. Um, Stefan, now my question is to you. If I would bring this um, material to you, what would you do with it to create a product for home use? Where would you start at first place? Well, first of all, I probably would scratch my head um, because, um, yeah, that's that's one of the, the the main topics here: how to to find ways to from to come from from your end to to what we have to deal with for uh, for, for home use. And 
after having listened to you, I'm, I'm really happy that we're in such a cozy place in the studio. It's everything under control and we don't have to deal with tons of equipment. At least we, we only do that once or, or every 10 years or so. So um, yeah, uh, maybe I should start uh, a bit a bit earlier, a bit from 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 the end user perspective to to have a, a proper answer here. Uh, so if we look at at, at the different uh, options to to have immersive uh, audio or object based audio at home, um, we have uh, different locations where we can where we're talking about. So so if you look at the pictures, uh, so it might might be a, a a top notch home cinema stuff. It might be uh, just your sofa and, and some speakers around you, or it might be even some some sound bars uh, that try to project uh, the the, the multi-channel audio into uh, into your living room, or it might be just the headphones. So so we have a, a lot of different uh, locations where we can can listen to that, and uh, I will not compare that to 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 you guys having having different locations everywhere and different venues, but. But the showcase is quite different. You can imagine uh, a, a difference from a from a home cinema to a to a headphone. That's 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 quite something. Um, and and today if you, we face two options how people would consume uh, that that audio. One is the the good old Blu-ray, and the other one is is streaming. Uh, and and all of them have different different uh, pros and cons. And uh, I don't want to go too deep into that. Um, but but uh, let's if you if you move to the next slide, please you you get a, a brief overview of of some. I'm sure I'm I'm still missing out some some options, but try to cover a lot. Um, so so which we have different technologies and and uh, and we have different fields where these uh, technologies come in place, and I probably uh, missed some broadcast topics on some of the the codex too. So sorry for that. Um, uh, so, so well, we have just well Dolby Atmos as a as a Blu-ray and a streaming and a broadcast uh, format. We have uh, Sony 360 as an as an object-based uh, immersive format right now, just on streaming and 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 on broadcast. I guess I'm not sure um, because the that the timing is so times are changing so rapidly. So it, it's hard for us to to keep up with everything. So please don't hesitate if. Anybody in the audience has some news for me? Please, please share it. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to to learn uh, because it's it's getting quite complex these days. We have MPEG H um, as a broadcast streaming format. We have DTSX, where I have no clue whether there's anybody on this planet streaming uh, DTSX, but I'm quite sure it's it's possible. And uh, well, to to name Oro 3D as well as an immersive format, not not necessarily being object based, but but at least uh, if if we talk about trans translation from your object based life experience uh, this would be another option to to have that on a blu ray or on a, on a, a, a packed streaming format um, so how do we create all these different formats and, and stuff uh, that's shown on my next slide again this is just just a fraction and and the most important part might be the the, the top uh, the, 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 on, at the bottom, the others, because uh, it's it's uh, we don't have enough time to go through all that, and my, I'm I'm definitely not the expert for all these uh, different platforms because there are simply so many. So the most uh, the most uh, common one uh, is I guess still Pro Tools as as a, a, a workstation. Uh, dealing with, with object-based audio for quite an, a, a long time. Same with Nuendo. Um, Pyramix is having a nice uh, uh, object-based uh, uh, panning system as well. There is a, a spatial sound wave system from, from Fraunhofer and there are many others, uh, spatial audio design and so on and so on. So so please forgive me if, if, if something is not on, on the list, but this is mainly to give you an overview of, of where the trouble starts. Uh, Meaning, meaning we have so many different platforms and different formats and codecs, uh, which is uh, quite tough then to keep up. And uh, on my next slide, that uh, shows the main question we, we ask ourselves before we are a production. Um, and the question is, what panel shall we use? Um, 
So Banu, if you could move to the next one, please. Yeah. Um, so this, and again, this is this is another fraction. So you see those dif different uh, uh, panels, and I don't want to go too much into detail with that. But you can imagine, and this is this is again just the, the most common ones we 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 are facing. Uh, well, not only, not mainly every day, but but from time to time, some of them we use day on a daily uh, basis, and some of them are integrated in the in the workstation. Some are not. Um, so this is, uh, and this is the, this is at the beginning when we started with 3D audio. We're happy. Oh, we have a 3D panel. Great. And now we had another one, and a third one, and a fourth one. And 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 then you try to start. Well, but now we started a project in in. I wouldn't even call it a, a format, but but the format is mainly for us from our perspective. The format is at first stage defined by the panel, uh, because when you define the panel. Then you're pretty much locked into the format you have to deliver, and if you have clients and if you have a market that is under such a huge change uh, and and such a rapid change, uh, and if you deal with projects that should live for for a bit longer than the next two weeks or four weeks, uh, then you think well which workflow might be the best for us to to deal with um, to make sure that in a few years time it's still up to date or we can still uh, or we we can accommodate to to what people ask for and what what we 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 have to deliver and i remember one of our first albums we've been producing uh, ourselves that was a recording we did from from scratch and and if, and it was very clear this will be an immersive project um we, I think we started three times uh, with three different panels in in different sampling rates and and all that stuff. So, so so this is where uh, I will not call it the mess starts, but but in a way it's uh, it's hard to 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 come from if 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 you if you make the wrong choice here, then you might get lost uh, along the way, and if your client changes plan in terms of oh by the way there's a new streaming service out there and we need this in this format and we didn't cope for that then we're totally stuck in 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 a one-way street and it's hard to to go back again without having to to re mix or at least reconfigure the whole the whole mixes again and then again it's it's about what 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 is to, is to be delivered, um, and and it's uh, and my main reaction is if somebody new comes along and say, hey, I have a new format for you, and 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 so on, and so on. They say, well, d don't bother me again with more panels. We have enough panels, um, and it, it's really hard to make 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 a choice. And uh, uh, so so that leads to the to the next slide, uh, asking the questions. This so one single question. How many panels do we need? I, I I wish we just had one, and make not the format dependent on the panel. Um, I I know I know I'm sh I'm sure we've been taking quite a quite a sidestep to your initial question. I come come back to that in a minute, uh, but but this this shows uh, at the very beginning. Uh, why we scratch our heads and 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 not even talking about how to get your information in, into these panels, but we have so many of them. Uh, that's that's the same thing with standards. So um, so um, and this uh, to just summarize that uh, we are kind of a, of a of a Babylon situation where we have on the next slide um, these panels don't talk to each other. So if you start with one, you, you can say, well, let's export this data and put it in in, in the other one. Uh, so 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 there is no 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 common description of that unless you you go for a kind of a, a predefined uh, format where uh, where this this data is already built in in some some metadata, um, which is uh, an industry standard. Uh, uh, called ADM, and uh, I have on the next slide a little explanation from the the IRT uh, that is at least my source dates back to 2020. Um, the the idea of an of an of a, a description model how to how to 
translate uh, object-based audio into into a kind of a standard. Um, so, in a nutshell, it's it's a multi-channel wave file uh, with additional metadata that describes uh, each object and its each uh, position of each object at any given time. Uh, so that's that's becoming quite complex. And uh, when I heard it, first heard about this idea or this standard, I thought, oh, well, this is great because now all our problems are solved. We have a standard, we can work according to standards, we have some specs and the industry may just adapt to that and we have an, an easy life and we can just, just use ADM as a, as a kind of a common uh, 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 model or like common tool to at least transfer our mixes into that format and then we could reopen that in a different uh, platform on a, for a different codec and so on and so on. So and so far that works quite good if you if you're not about to change the the, the technology basics or the codec basics. So if you create an, an ADM file for an, on one platform, uh, we can send that to somebody else. We're working on a Pro Tool. Somebody else is, is having a new endo. They will open up that, that ADM file and they get all the information we need in terms of, of panning, positioning levels and stuff uh, exactly the same way. But again, um, and that that was quite of a shock to me uh, when uh, because we we kind of simple guys thinking oh there's a standard that's good that's easy. On the next slide we see again Babylon. So ADM is a huge standard, but there are different subsets of ADM specs, and they are not necessarily or most of them not at all compatible to each other and there are not even even uh, public uh, available tools to convert from one ADM to another. So this means, and uh, and we try to avoid any brand names and stuff, but but uh, I think it's it's uh, it's unavoidable. Um, to to give an example here, so so let's uh, let's say we have decided we started a, a we've got a project in, um, and it's clear this shall be a Dolby Atmos. Atmos uh, sorry for that. Dolby Atmos based mix. So we'll open up the, the, the Pro Tools in example, uh, open up the built in Pro Tools Atmos panel, uh, made that decision, have a beautiful mix. The client is happy, everybody's happy. And then somebody shows up uh, and say, well, uh, that's good, but now we need this in Sony 360, MPEG H, Oro 3D, whatever, you name it. Uh, then you thought, okay, let's do that, take that ADM file and convert it. There's no way to do that. So because the structure of these ADM files and the number of objects that, that can be addressed. We have in some codecs, we have beds, in some some we don't, in some we have subwoofers, in some we don't. So so and and some 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 codecs or, or technologies not even know how to write ADM. So so um, again, we are stuck. We have a, a kind of a, a common standard, but it turns out that we have to stay within the same technology so far. We we really hope, and I, I see some signs that there might be some some tools available sooner or later that make make our lives a bit easier. But but in most cases, when we start to define the panel, meaning when we start to define the, the format we will deliver in the end, uh, this, this is predefined of what we will be able to deliver to the public. Um, so, uh, so that's, um, that's that part of it. Um, and so having said all that, so this is not, not to, to tell everybody how difficult our life is. Uh, it, it, it's great, we have a lot of fun, but um, uh, we, we, of course, we have those workarounds and we do know how we deal with that. We do, for example, we, we, I remember a project we have, we've been, uh, that might be a, a quite a good example. We've started a project as a Dolby Atmos mix, and there was a there was an event in Hamburg at at the at the university, and they have a thirty 
two channel full dome setup. Um, so the, the main question is how to how to 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 come from our Dolby Atmos mix to a 30 channel uh, full dome setup. So what we did um, we opened up our, our 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 Atmos session, positioned the the objects the same way we we had it in the Atmos, but in that case used as a spatial sound wave system and uh, put, place the objects the same position here and there. You can imagine that's 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 kind of a nightmare to do with all, all the stuff and make sure that everybody's in the right spot. Rendered this out on a, on a, on a, on a speaker layout we, we, we had to use for that place and then had 32 channels uh, that uh, could easily play back in, in the other venue. So, so it's not, not a click of a button to say, well, put it there, import it and, and go for it. So having, having said all that, um, uh, how to deal with that on a live situation. Um, so we, we don't even have specs in, in the studios and from format to another format. Uh, and there are not at all any specs to come, f at least as far as I know, I'm happy to, to hear more news about that. But uh, to my knowledge, uh, there is no single system that we could just import. And, uh, and of course, we'll have to uh, take into account that there are some other aspects to it um, that, that we may consider when we take a live show to a, a recorded show that can play back in people's home. So on the next slide, um, we'll have, um, what was that? Okay, so I, I, I missed that one. Um, yeah, so that's that's a little bit of of, of an overview of uh, of the different uh, uh, colors of ADM we 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 talking about. Um, so you see, it, it's 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 already uh, kind of confusing. And uh, on the next slide, um, I'd like to. Yeah, uh, we can move on. Oh, sorry, I didn't I didn't put that. Yes, the, that's the one I I want to 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 have here as a as a as a guide. Um, so, guess you have your live show finished, and uh, uh, and you and we decide. Well, how can we take that home? First of all, we have a huge difference. We want to reproduce. Uh, the whole event, including the audience. This is something that, that you mainly miss out because you probably won't, won't capture the audience to, to put the audience back in the PA system. Um, so, so that's something um, where, uh, where we start having differences. Nevertheless, I'd be happy, especially if you, if you could, yeah, you had this example, Banu, when you said you'll have a, uh, a band on stage and they're gonna move and they have some some positions and stuff um, in most cases when we get a project in we get a bunch of tracks and i'm very happy if these tracks are labeled in some cases you get them track one track two track three and you guess track four um, i would be happy and, uh, <laughs> and uh and so guess you you get all this information. And in most cases, these days, you have a video along with that. So we follow what we see on the video edit. Um, so we, we try to figure out the positions on stage just by looking at the video. And of course, it would be great to get the metadata from you guys and we would have an, an option to, to, to adapt these or to, to, to edit these, but at least have them. Um, so, so there's, there, but I, I think there is still a long way to go here, um, but um, but I don't want to be too pessimistic on that. And I'm sure there will be, as we speak now, I'm sure some other people will have talks as well. And and we all see that as a as a kind of an issue because we all want to speed up uh, projects because we all uh, suffer from not having enough time and not having enough budgets to to deal with the same thing all over and over again. Uh, so, so that's one thing we would really, really appreciate. And I, I'm, I'm, I didn't hear of any any live PA system that is talking ADM. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, 
but there might be OC, OSC and there might be ADM and, and there might be some, some conversion tools and stuff. Uh, but still, this is, this is still a way to go. Um, from, a, from a creative or an, 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 an home mixing aspect, um, again, we have some differences as well. So we, 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 as I said, we have to capture the audience because most people want to listen to the audience. Uh, and listen to to the hand claps around you. Uh, they shouldn't be too too close to you because you get annoyed. And and in some cases, I have to learn for streaming formats, people like to get rid of the audience because it's kind of annoying on on random played streaming uh, uh, tracks. Um, but in most cases, if we talk about a live concert, then we have to deal with the audience. Second question is, uh, where is the listener? And I don't want to want to start again with the discussions we have for at least the last 25 years. Um, does anybody want to sit in the middle of the musicians? Where do you want to see? Do you have the first row? You want the directors play? Well, we, we have, you name it. We have so many options and at some stage we'll have to make a decision or we have to make multiple uh, uh, mixes, but at some point we'll have to define that listener's position. So I think that's comparable to, to you when you plan a, a live thing and you say you have different zones and sections. Um, so that's that's a similar uh, discussion here uh, to say, well, how do we, how do we deal with that? Um, and then, um, and, and this was an, as an interesting comment I got from a, from a, a, a video director after we've played a live concert in in immersive audio uh, along with the video and we have you may have may seen early on the, the 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 studio picture from Javier you you saw uh, that's a that's that's one of our studios and and you see a big screen so so you have an experience an immersive mix and a huge screen and uh, the direct said oh the video sucks um, and I said we we have to change the way we 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 shoot the videos because with all the the zooming and and all the 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 the, the, the cuts from one musician to another, you'll be totally totally distracted from from that immersive audio experience you hear. So so we have to deal with that gap and and have to make a decision how or well, how realistically put do we put the the listener uh, in. In uh, on his sofa into in the middle of the concert, I think that's another big difference to to what you have on a on a real life situation because then people will just watch on stage uh, or, or watch stage and and just decide, okay, well I I, I watch this guy or the other guy, uh, but but it's still the same perspective, and. Um, and and this gap is getting bigger since we deal with, with with immersive audio because most of people will then just feel like being in the middle of it and then we'll have this this gap gap between uh, audio and video. So uh, in a nutshell, it's it it's uh, coming to my to my last um, last slide then um, that says. Um, we have to translate. So, so even if we had a, a genius system that translates all your metadata to the metadata we need for 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 mixing, then it would definitely not be a one-step process. It would be a good guide, and I would really appreciate if we had that. But uh, we still need the translation to to well. It's it, it's easy to to see that here. You have uh, much. Uh, a, Bigger difference in size of the room, in the number of speakers, in in well, in audience or no audience. So so there's still a lot to do. But um, again, so far we are lacking of tools to to have a one standard or a a common standard where everybody would adapt to. So I think that was um, hope. I, I, I don't know if, if I could at all answer uh, your question, but I, I was trying my best. I, I think people are um, 
eager to discuss with all of us. I think maybe it's time to change to the other room, right? Rafael, Elena? It is, yes. Um, okay, so we have yes. um, almost the, 14 Thank minutes you very much time. to all the presenters at that point, and please find the link to the discussion room in the chat.